Okay, so this is the long-awaited Maria 350 integrated amp test. Now, this is not the actual comparison that will come later, but up until now, we haven't done... Oh, <laughs> I'm supposed to look at the camera. <laughs> what are you looking at? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's like baby, looking at the PS audios over there. And going, I was just thinking, they actually look pretty good. <laughs> anyway, uh, now you know why we're not professionals. Um, yeah, up until now, I had, not, I had not actually heard the Maria by itself. I had only heard the Maria with the uh, Daniel Hurt speakers, specifically the Eva. And of course, I'm extremely impressed with that system. You can see the review in the link below. Anyway, in a conversation with Mark um, in the last couple of weeks, he said, you should listen to the Maria. It's really good. We've done comparisons. We've brought them to top uh, dealers all over Europe, including distributors, and he's getting extremely good feedback. So I said, sure. But let me give you the uh, backstory first. Um, I met Mark, uh, this is going to be a very short, abbreviated uh, backstory. Maybe one of these days I'll do a much bigger, uh, a longer one. I've known Mark since about 1989 ish. At the time, um, he was, uh, he had a company called Cello. And uh, we drove down to Chicago CES to take a look at the system. And wow, it was really, really impressive. Subsequently became a dealer. And then after he left Cello, he started a company called Red Rose. And we became a dealer of Red Rose Music. We sold primarily their two products as well as their big speakers. And those were very nice. Anyway, 9-11 happened. Unfortunately, shortly afterwards, Red Rose had to close. Mark uh, then went to Switzerland for a bit, started Daniel Hertz, uh, and he has a, an office also in, um, in uh, Venice, in Italy. Uh, he invited me to the Las Vegas Consumer Electronics Show to his um, suite. I believe it was either at the Venetian or the Mirage, I couldn't remember. And again, it was extremely impressive. All new speakers, he still makes the speakers, it's called the M1. The electronics at the time were different. They were uh, more traditional can, um, type of electronics where you have analog preamp, analog amplifiers, and so on. But extremely impressive. Unfortunately, as much as I wanted to be a dealer at the time, I had already made too many commitments and I was cash flow short. So we didn't do it. <clears throat> Over the years, I would follow what he was doing and then I lost touch with him. Uh, sometime in November, he reached out to me and said, we should have a conversation. So we started talking, and three hours later, he says, oh, by the way, I've got this new stuff. And he told me about the Maria and the speakers and so on. And while he's talking to me, I'm on the website looking, and I said, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. Now, normally I wouldn't. I have very strict guidelines about how we would bring things in. And that's because over the years, I've made a lot of mistakes. And by following the guidelines, I make less mistakes. But because it's a mark, and because I've known of his history and his capabilities and his ear, I figured it would be uh, okay. It would be uh, it would it wouldn't be a, a gamble. I'm glad we did because certainly so far it's been amazing. But let me continue with the backstory. So, ordered the uh, system, uh, two systems. We ordered the Maria with the Ava speakers, the bookshelf speakers, and the Maria with the Amber speakers. So uh, some of you who've already watched the uh, Ava review will know that Mark tunes the amplifier for the speakers. In the case of the Daniel Hertz, the Maria is tuned specifically for that speaker. So every speaker has different um, idiosyncrasies. Frequency response has little issues here and there. Impedance has little issues here and there. And he uses the tuning in the Maria to optimize so that the end result is much, much better than you would, you would think. Anyway, the speakers left the factory and he gave me a FedEx tracking number and of course I'm anxiously looking at the tracking number every day. The shipment sits at FedEx's warehouse in Italy for three weeks, it didn't move. I finally reached out to Mark and I said, what's going on? So they looked into it. The shipment was finally released. We got it just before Christmas, I think two, three days before Christmas. As soon as it arrived, the guys told me I went to the back right away. We started tearing it apart. The first thing I noticed was there was FedEx tape on the boxes. And I thought, this is really weird. Then I thought, ah, maybe Mark ran out of packaging materials and went to FedEx and bought some packaging materials and so on. Um, anyway, 
as soon as we opened it, I realized something was badly wrong. Both Maria integrated amplifiers, now they're, they're finished in perspex, so this black, hand-cut, hand-polished to a shine like you wouldn't believe, had fingerprints, smudges, dirt and dust everywhere. I couldn't believe it, I was stunned. The amber speakers, the floor standing speakers, had chip on one of the speakers, and then later on as we looked at it uh, closer, we could see the veneers had cracked inside the uh, finishing. And on the front face, if you look at an angle, you can see there's distress marks on the front. Uh, in other words, there's been a tremendous, potentially, the speakers have been potentially dropped perhaps, so that you can see this distress cracks or, or, or um, marks, if you will. Anyway, as soon as I saw this, I immediately called Mark. So I catch him around 10, 11 o'clock our time, so five, six hours ahead in Italy. And he said, hey, Adrian, how are you? So how do you like it? So he's all excited to hear my feedback. And I very quietly told him what happened. Uh, the, the, the reaction from Mark was unbelievable. He was so upset. He couldn't believe what had happened. I sent him pictures. And uh, he felt worse than I did. And I bought the stuff. Um, Unfortunately, all this happened, of course, during the Christmas holidays, so nothing could be done. Um, what I can tell you is that over the holidays, between the 26th on, literally on the 26th on, Mark and Daniel, his right-hand person, spent every day for a few hours with me through uh, TeamViewer showing me how to disassemble the, the, the Marias, how to reassemble it, check a bunch of things and so on, and then remotely they would reload the program just to make sure that the program was okay. Anyway, finally after a bunch of fussing, everything worked. Now kudos to Mark and Daniel who took valuable time from their holidays to look after me. <clears throat> Not only that, um, today is uh, January the what, 9th? 10th. Mark is making arrangements for Daniel to fly from Venice with replacement products. This is insane. I mean, that is customer service. So kudos to Mark and Daniel for doing that. Um, anyway, let's uh, talk about the stats. The Maria is 350 watts into 8 ohms per channel, rated 500 into 4. Mark tells me that these numbers are actually quite conservative. He's seen uh, about 700 watts into 4 ohms with extremely low distortion. The Maria isn't just an integrated amp. It includes, in, in, internally, it has a proprietary integrated circuit that Mark and his um, engineers have co-developed. And inside the integrated circuit are a number of very interesting features. First of all, it has C-Wave, which is a technology that Mark is a, and his engineers have been working on for a no, uh, about 15 or 20 years. And it's essentially trying to solve the age-old issue with digital for some people not everybody, obviously, but for some people, digital just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound relaxing. It doesn't sound natural. And hence, a lot of people continue to enjoy their analog. Now, I'm not going to go into the analog-digital debate. I'm just saying that that's something that exists. Um, in the case of Mark Levinson, um, what is interesting is that Mark has spent the vast majority of his life being involved with and immersed in live music. He plays music. He was in some of the best bands. He has recorded and sat in with some of the top jazz luminaries. He has recorded some of the finest uh, uh, classical uh, uh, players. He's very much knowledgeable about what live music sounds like. And his reference for recorded music is 30 inch per second master tapes. Um, so what he's trying to do is achieve that kind of sound through digital. He believes that with C-Wave, they've succeeded. So th that's included in the uh, chip. Also included is tuning capability, as I mentioned earlier. So if you were to buy the Maria and you have uh, a different speaker, uh, through TeamViewer, Mark and his team can, with your help, optimize the system so that the amplifier is working really well with your speakers to get the very best results that you're looking for. The Maria also has the ability to uh, 
work uh, to to create um, um, extra, uh, a crossover, if you will, for for biamping your speakers. It can also be by uh, it can also sorry be bridge for even more power, or you can order it also as a four channel amplifier. So there's quite a lot to it. It also has a headphone amplifier. It has um, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but I didn't test those. And then finally, it has a very good DAC built in. All right, so let's talk about the sound. The system that I used includes the um, Sonus Faber Stradivari, which is behind me, the uh, Wilson Audio Sasha V, and the Serafinos from Sonus Faber. So I used three different speakers. I used the Lumen P1 as a streamer only, USB out into the Maria, Cables were the Nordos Valhalla, the uh, Shunyata um, Delta, and the AudioQuest Diamond USB cable. Um, I did not use any special power cables for this particular review, but I will talk about that subsequently. Um, I did not use any power conditioners for the Maria. I plugged the Maria straight into the wall. All right. Cold. The Maria had been off and not used for a couple of days because the guys have had a bunch of different demonstrations and so the Maria was sitting off to the side. So when I connected it, it was cold. It was about three o'clock in the morning and um, right upon turn on, the sound was competent. It was okay, nothing special. If you told me that it was $17,000, I would say overpriced. Um, good, but not seventeen thousand, maybe five thousand, maybe six thousand dollars. <throat> but because I knew that I had heard such magic out of the Maria Ava system, uh, I would just let it burn in. And as usual, I was going to tell you whatever I heard. So I let it warm up for a bit, went and do some did some work, and then next thing I know, it was an hour later. So I came back and started to listen again. Started with the same cuts. I won't go through all the cuts because I'm using the similar cuts to talk about. Uh, as I have with all the other videos. A complete transformation, so much so that I actually doubted myself. I, I, I could not believe the transformation. It was, it went from competent to sublime. It, it um, I don't know how to describe it because it wasn't just like it went from good to better, it went from better to great. It was a completely different animal. Where when it was cold, it, it sounded, like, okay, deep bass was good, but mid and upper bass was a little bit threadbare, a little bit lacking in energy and drive. It sounded, it wasn't propulsive. It was just, yeah, it's like waking up, you know, just like when you first wake up, you don't wake up and go, yeah, you know, I'm full of energy, you know, let's get going. It just sounded like it just woke up. Mid range was a little bit thin. It was clean, harmonically a little bit thin. Highs were there, but dry, not airy, not, ex well, extended, yeah, but just just wasn't blooming. It just didn't do anything special for me. As I say, sound stage was nice and wide, but depth was definitely cut, foreshortened. Completely changed. All the areas that I just talked about that were uh, nothing special, completely changed. Um, to the point where I had to check. I uh, listened to a few more cuts and then I immediately switched over to the Macintosh C2700 preamp and the D'Agostino S350 progression amplifier, which we have in the same room. And since it was the same room, I thought, okay, it's easy for me to just compare. So I did. Um, and the amazing thing is that for all intents and purposes, the Maria, at a fraction of the cost, easily kept up. In some areas, actually outdid it. I, I won't go into those details, that would be a conversation for another time. What I can tell you is that combination compared to the Maria, um, I would have a hard time necessarily choosing between the two. The Maria had just completely changed into this thing of beauty. Um, let me go into specific details. The big sound stage now literally became 3D. It, it ex Banded beyond the speakers and some recordings, it came forward, and I felt being I, I felt enveloped by the sound. The depth layering was just stunning. Um, images now took on size and dimension, where before they were flat and and two D, 
Um, but at the same time, they had clarity and uh, dimension. It had uh, precision. Um, it was also neutral, and this is something very interesting. Um, when I played different recordings, the, the presentation would change. Sometimes the soundstage would be big, sometimes the soundstage would be smaller, sometimes the depth would be amazing, sometimes the depth would be more two-dimensional. It changed with the recording, as it should. If it's something neutral, it should. There are other systems where they always present a certain sound, and you may like that sound, and so would I. But the point is that the, the, the um, Daniel Hertz Maria is very neutral. Um, on purest recordings, the atmosphere was very real. Um, in a follow-up uh, review, I will talk about this, and I, I will you give some uh, uh, specific recommendations, but I won't in this particular case. In one particular cut that I use, which again I'll talk about in a follow-up review, the sense of presence and atmosphere was unnerving. It, it, it was just shocking. Bass. Pretty much as good as I've heard, except for when you get into the really big, crazy amplifiers that cost as much as a house. Um, as I said, I switched over to the D'Agostino, and it kept uh, kept pace with it, uh, note for note. The the arguably the D'Agostino might be slightly more punchy and slightly more round in its attack, but the articulation and speed of the Maria was better. I mean, it just kept pace with it. Um, and throughout the bass region. Now, in the upper and mid bass, I would say the D'Agostino had a little bit more harmonic richness, maybe a little bit more lifelike, but that could also be because of the uh, tube preamplifier, the Macintosh that I was using. But suffice to say, I didn't find that the Maria was really lacking until I compared. And then, even then, I would say, yeah, it could sound like that. I would maybe prefer that a bit more, but still. It was shockingly good. Um, Mid-range, very smooth, delicate, had detail galore, but still had a nice warmth. And at the same time, the warmth was neutral. In other words, if the recording was warm, it was warm. When the recording was dry, it was dry. But at no point did it ever highlight or make it worse. It didn't, it didn't glare at me. It didn't give me a sibilant. It didn't give me a, a headache. Um, you could easily discern the instruments, and this is something that isn't always the case with some electronics. Some electronics are either too um, cold or too sterile or sometimes too rich, especially older tube electronics, for example. You might find that not with the Maria. It was just quite neutral. Um, again, I, I, I want to say if there's a slight criticism, it might be that it might be a little bit on the light side harmonically. I would caveat, though, as much as I've done everything that I can with the Maria here, neither Mark, Daniel, or my si myself are confident that this is 100% the way that it should be because of the damage and the fact that we think that the integrated amp might also have been dropped, and we have evidence to show that there's a possibility that there may be micro cracks in the six-layer PC boards. Uh, we won't know that. Uh, when Daniel comes, he'll be bringing not only uh, new replacements, but also some boards that we can go through and check as well. I'll report as, as uh, the time comes. Um, high frequencies very airy. As I mentioned earlier, when it's cold, um, it didn't have that air, that bloom, that natural, uh, delicate sort of sound. But now it does. Uh, when it's warmed up, it has all of those things in spades. And it's not bright. It's detailed without being bright, nor is it dark and lifeless like some other Class D amplifiers that I've heard. It's definitely not that. I was trying to think of what it, uh, 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 electronics that might help you understand for those of you who've um, been around a while. Um, spectral electronics are one of the ones that is one of the ones that I thought about. The best spectrals have the same kind of quality, the same kind of speed, articulation, transient response, neutrality, and detail. 
Uh, same thing with the bass, very fast, very articulate, maybe lacking a little bit in terms of ultimate oomph, like say a Krell or the best Hegels. It doesn't have quite that, but it's not missing it by far. Um, a, a beautiful shimmer in the high frequencies, very light and delicate. So the best spectrals sound like that. Uh, fast and explosive. I was thinking in terms of sports analogy, it, it's like Hussein Bolt, but maybe with the muscularity of a Ben Johnson, our Canadian Jamaican transplant, right? Those of you who were there or you watched when Ben first won the Olympics and then got subsequently disqualified, right? The guy just exploded to this day, just left everybody behind. You know, his big 40 inch thighs just going up and down because it's so powerful. Um, but maybe more apt, um, Muhammad Ali in his prime. You know, he was never the most muscular, he was never the most defined, he was never the biggest, but boy, when he, he was just fast and so smooth. Yeah, he was just uh, graceful. There you go, graceful. There was this sense of effortlessness. It wasn't like somebody else, say Mike Tyson. And look at Mike Tyson, the guy is fast, but he's like a beast. When he hammers, you can see, you know, but with, with Muhammad Ali, he, he punched you out with the power, but it was the speed at the same time that was more interesting. Anyway, that's sort of my way of trying to explain what I hear. Or Bruce Lee, right? Uh, um, if, you, if you watch some of the uh, uh, videos, uh, the kind of speed that he exhibited uh, was insane. So anyway, that's that's what the Maria sounds to me like. It's got that kind of speed, but also has the, the, the kind of power and energy that you wouldn't associate sometimes with this kind of speed. Um, and as I say, neutrality, the, 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 the thought that kept coming back, it's neutral. It, it responds differently to different recordings, and but but never at the expense of the music. And then last thing I'm going to leave you, the one thing that perhaps is most unique about the Maria of everything that I've heard so far in terms of integrated amplifiers, it has the special ability to portray magic if it's in the recording. I'll give you one example. Um, Friday night in San Francisco, great album. Um, the particular cut I'm talking about is Mediterranean Sundance. You have two of the finest guitars of all times playing live in front of an audience. Paco de Lucia is on the left, Aldo Miola is on the right, right? They start playing and one is supporting, the other one goes into a solo. Then the roles reverse. The other starts going to a solo, and the other one supports. And then now it's time to show off. Each goes on. Each starts going like crazy. Who's faster? Who can spit the most outrageous riffs? And then the other gun goes, okay, now it's my turn to show off. And then he goes nuts. The audience is absolutely going crazy at this point. This cut is 11 minutes and, and 30 seconds. It goes by and you don't even realize it's done. That magic is lightning in a bottle captured. It's a good recording. It's not the best recording ever, but you don't realize because that magic, that performance, that energy that was caught by two of the finest uh, uh, guitarists ever, that's, that's one thing that will never be repeated again because subsequent to that, they released the studio album. I thought, wow, because the live album's so good, the studio must be amazing because now you can edit out all the technical imperfections. The most boring Mediterranean cut I've ever heard in my life. I wouldn't even listen to it. Literally two minutes into it, I turned it off. It's just terrible. Not that the playing is bad, but that life in comparison to the live, just gone. Technically perfect, but that magic, that energy, the spont spontaneity, just not there. The Maria does that better than almost anything, anywhere close to its price that I'm aware of. It is able to portray that, reproduce that with the kind of energy and soul. Now, interesting side note, many years later, 
Paco de Lucia met Mark Levinson. Now, I don't know if they actually met before. I don't know this, but I do know this part. Uh, they met together, and Mark was able to demonstrate what, uh, uh, no, sorry, Elde Miola, I didn't mean uh, Paco de Lucia, Elde Miola met uh, Mark, and Mark was able to show Elde Miola what C-Wave does with Elle's recordings. And Elder Miller was so impressed that he insists that Mark now starts remastering his recordings. And in fact, while visiting Mark, he played uh, a solo guitar cut for him, and he, he calls it For Only You. Mark recorded that, lightning in the bottle again, and I have a copy. And I've played it a few times, and I'm telling you, it's sensational. That's the interesting thing about Mark Levinson. He has this extraordinary gift of being able to somehow network with the most amazing musicians and get them to record for him. And then he's got all these incredible, this archive of incredible music, and I'm fortunate to have some of it. I've listened to it. And I tell you what, if, if the cost of having these recordings is simply for me to buy and be a dealer, sign me up all day long. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Anyway, final thoughts. And then at some point, uh, we will do the comparison videos. Notes. Number one, let it warm up or don't turn it off. There's a standby switch. You can leave it on standby. Don't unplug it unless you're going away. Leave it uh, plugged in. It, it, it will reward you in spades and very quickly as soon as you turn it on. Uh, power cables do make a difference. I didn't go into power cables details uh, in this particular video, uh, but just trust me on this. Power cables make a big difference. It appears to prefer copper to silver cables from the little bit of experimentation I've done. Um, it doesn't come with a remote. Big bugaboo for a lot of people, including myself. But if you're using streaming and your streamer has a good volume control, and note what I just said, a good volume control. The Eversolo is a very good streamer, but the volume control sucks, like absolutely sucks. Don't use the Eversolo's volume control. If you've got an Eversolo, that's what you're using, use the volume control in this unit, okay? Um, so just be careful with that. And then finally, Mark says, the C-Wave technology and the internal DAC makes even Spotify and YouTube programming sound really good. I've not done that, I've not compared it, I don't know. All I do know is that the internal DAC and I've tested the internal deck separately, is very good indeed. Okay, more to come when I do the separate comparisons. For now, this is part one, if we can call it that. Thanks for watching. If you like this, please subscribe. You know the details. Uh, turn on the all of those kinds of things, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.